Uh, I want to thank the library for having us here. Uh, they put out on the tables uh, application for a business library card. So it's a little bit different than a personal library card. So if you have a business in Niles, you can get a business library card and use all of the library resources. Thank you very much, Bernadetta, for that. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> So we have a great program this morning, um, our expanded stakeholders meeting. We're gonna hear about what's going on in Niles um, in just a minute. Uh, I do wanna say we have some new members. I'm not sure if any of these three are here today. No, 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 okay. And then we have some things coming up that we hope that we will see you at. Um, I just wanna say um, thank you uh, to everyone for putting this program together, to Erin for putting all of our events together. She does a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, the Niles Chamber Legislative Committee, Janet Spector Bishop, who's here. Um, and then we have a few other people in the room. We have uh, Library Board Trustee Becky Keene is here. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, Library Trustee Patty uh, Rosansky is here. Government uh, Supervisor Karen Diamond is here. And my new friends, uh, James Mayer from the Niles uh, Township. Thank you. Um, so we can just jump right in. We have a lot to talk about uh, this morning, starting with John Malenaby, uh, who is the head of economic development for the village of Niles. Thank you, John. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking about Niles and what we've got going in the community. Um, maybe some of you have heard me speak before, uh, maybe at one of the uh, previous chamber events, but um, I really came from the private sector and uh, I conducted market feasibility studies for a variety of retailers and developers. And so one of the most uh, fun projects was Mall of America, which has just about every kind of retailer and entertainment venue up in Bloomington, Minnesota, outside of Minneapolis. And one of the others was Easton Town Center in Columbus, Ohio, um, which was developed by uh, Steiner and Associates. Um, so I've also, uh, not too long ago, worked on the Motorola campus out in Schaumburg and what that might look like. And some of that is um, under redevelopment at the moment. And others were North Star Mall in Collin Creek um, in Texas and Southridge Mall up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, the Myrtle Beach Air Force Base. And um, obviously I came from Wheeling before I uh, came to Niles and uh, we developed a Wheeling Town Center. So we developed about 941 new apartment units and 100,000 square feet of retail space with restaurants and retail facilities adjacent to the Wheeling train station. So uh, the transit oriented development really helped. They hadn't seen any new product like that. But um, economic development is a lot like fishing. I really like fishing. And uh, so I fish quite a bit. And I think that uh, Niles um, has the right kind of bait to lure businesses to the community. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, fishing is a lot like economic development. And I think this is a great community in which to practice my fishing for businesses. So we are working on the redevelopment plans for Golf Mill. And it's really about a collaboration with the Sterling organization, the owner of the mall. And we're working on a public-private partnership. Um, there is an existing TIF district. So we're looking at partnering with the developer and providing some assistance over the life of the TIF, they have to generate new property tax increment in order to achieve any kind of incentive. So if they don't build something fantastic, they don't get funding in terms of TIF funding. Um, it's all based on what they build. So we're looking at a $440 million redevelopment in phases. And one of the um, interesting things about it is it's going to have a central gathering place um, on the water with water features, 
where you can actually dine on the water. And there's probably not a lot of places like that in the Chicago metropolitan area will be able to dine on the water. We'll utilize the detention ponds and that as an amenity. There's gonna be 650,000 square feet of new retail space and 900 potentially luxury apartment units in phases. And a 61,000 square foot medical office building is being considered along with uh, either one or two hotels, maybe a 250 room hotel or two select service type hotels. So right now the mall is about 1.1 million square feet. We're gonna demolish about 600,000 square feet of obsolete and closed mall space. Um, and again, all of this is contingent upon a formal redevelopment, redevelopment agreement with uh, the Sterling organization, but um, Golf Mill Park, which you've seen on Greenwood and Church Street, um, is really just a great amenity to the village. And that's going to help to uh, bring more residential uh, and have some green space for those residential um, occupants. And we plan to create a pedestrian promenade from the Golf Mill Park over to the central gathering place in the center of the property um, so that there'll be interchange with pedestrians from that park into the central gathering area. And so we're gonna have restaurants clustered around the water. And that's what it's gonna be have really um, interesting. We feel that restaurants are going to drive a lot of traffic. So it's almost gonna be like a downtown area with the retail, the restaurant, the entertainment, the medical office, even hotel meeting space. So if you have a convention and then, then these folks actually have a place to walk out and, and uh, shop and dine at additional restaurants, have additional meetings at conventions and so forth. And so we feel that the mall has all the transportation infrastructure, the land area and all the parking to support this large scale mixed use development. I mean, there's other places in the village that the, the village has considered like entertainment districts and things. But I mean, you look at like 2E Avenue and some of those corridors, just how much can they really support? This mall has 86 acres, and we can put a lot of the things that we're looking for into this property. Here is a, a rendering, our site plan, of what we're talking about doing. And again, site plans change all the time. But um, so right here is about a 300-unit Texas Wrap apartment building adjacent to Golf Mill Park, the new Golf Mill Park off of Greenwood. So these residents can walk right over to the park and walk their dog. And it, it's not like they're out in the, the middle of the, um, the mall parking lot. So, and then um, someone asked me a question before this started. There are existing, sorry. Um, there are existing leases with uh, J.C. Penney and Alta and Burlington and Target, that the developer has to work through. Um, they have to; those are those tenants have leasehold interests, so they can't just move them. Um, they're going to demolish them all and work around them. And those are some really good tenants, also. I mean, Target's a good good tenant. We we like to keep them. We did look at J.C. Penney as a, uh, you know, are they gonna be around? They went through bankruptcy and now they're owned by Simon Property Group in Brookfield, which are the two largest mall owners in the country. So they're pretty sophisticated and they know that they're sitting on of some valuable property if there is a redevelopment. So this is a rendering of the water features with the restaurants clustered around. And these aren't necessarily new. These have been circulated by the developer in the past, but we really think this is going to be the centerpiece of the redevelopment of the mall and being able to dine on the water. If you've ever been to like Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, there's a development called the Broadway there. And they have all these water features and the lighting is pretty spectacular and they have all the restaurants around there and they have outdoor seating and it's really well done. Um, this is more of a kind of an aerial view of the water features, of the restaurants clustered around them, the retail space, and then some of the residential that might come in the second phase of the development. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, as far as the timeline, we have a public-private partnership. We've negotiated a tax increment financing deal with them. 
they have to create that increment of 440 million. And we have uh, a TIF incentive that we've uh, locked in on, and we will likely have that before our village board later this month for approval. So we'll have that term sheet and then that will go, it'll provide the major deal points. And uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is also have an open house at the mall and where residents can come and see the plans and talk to the developers and provide thoughts and ideas. We did one of those up in um, Hawthorne Center in Vernon Hills. I'm a consultant also, and I, I was involved in, in that project. And so um, Centennial, the owners of the mall, actually had an open house and invited the, the whole community there. And they had it in the old Carson's department store. So there was a lot of room for everybody and they had monitors and all kinds of uh, renderings of what they were planning on doing. So we hope to do that with the uh, developer. And we uh, think that the RDA, the redevelopment agreement will go pretty quickly because we've spent so much time on the term sheet. So in my opinion, I think the Gulf Mill Mall redevelopment will redefine Niles. Um, we really, this mall has been in decline for a number of years, and I think it's the most exciting development um, in many years. And I think, uh, you know, I've been around a long time. I've lived in the area, so I watched like the old teletype site get redeveloped with Village Crossings, and then the... Um, former A.B. Dick site, um, which became, you know, Walmart and everything, and then um, Target Builder Square on the Wilson Jones site. So those were great developments and have generated a lot of sales tax revenue and property tax revenue in the village. But I think that Golf Mill can enhance the Milwaukee Avenue corridor and Golf Road and even Greenwood. Um, you know, it's, and it, though all those businesses are in an intercepting position to uh, for consumers tra traveling to the mall. So a vibrant mall can help other businesses in that corridor. We, uh, you know, we, we don't live in a vacuum. So we have to look at what's happening with e-commerce and how that's impacting retail sales. So it's over a trillion dollars now um, in 2022, uh, according to the United States Department of Commerce. It actually moderated a little bit after um, the COVID-19 pandemic. But I mean, even a lot of the restaurants have had, had to make modifications. There are actually, some of them are having smaller dining areas and adding you know, another lane to their drive through Some of them have like triple lanes with one devoted exclusively to e-commerce sales. And more retailers are uh, working on an omni-channel approach and you know, brick and mortar sales growth has only been like 5% and e-commerce has been 14 and a half or 15%. So um, it was down a little bit in 2021, but um, it's still pretty strong. And so we, when we're looking at what we're going to add to Golf Mill, we're going to have to add more experiential type things and people still got to eat. They can't eat on the internet. And so, um, you know, I... <coughs> Melanopy and Associates, we've been tracking retail sales since before 1985. And so this is a graph of the Chicago metropolitan area's retail sales. And so this is really, you know, how, how much pie is there and what kind of slice or what kind of market penetration can the village of Niles achieve? And so it's, it's very interesting to see like how much retail sales have grown since 1985. So, we're up to about 162 billion in the metropolitan area. And there was a you know pretty significant dip in 2019 because of COVID, all the restaurants were closed, uh, businesses that weren't essential businesses had to close. And so, you know, Niles has been really fortunate. So I looked at Niles retail sales, um, not only in total, but in by retail category. And so we're over 1.8 billion. Um, which is we're really fortunate that we have all these essential businesses and that we have Walmart and Target and sort of your bread and butter retailers. So, you know, we, we've grown from a little over 1.2 billion up to 1.8. So our economic development efforts, even preceding my time, have been very effective in enhancing the, re the sales tax revenue stream to the Village of Niles. So... Um, as I mentioned, I track retail sales in the metro area. So it's nice to look at what were the growth rates 
in the metropolitan area. So as I mentioned, some of the brick and mortar retail, you know, their growth rates weren't that significant, but th these are the totals, which do include some e-commerce. And so we've seen years where it was only like 1.4% growth, but then in 2021 following COVID, sales in the metropolitan area increased 28.5%. So, and I've also provided some of the retail sales changes. So we were up 33 billion um, after COVID, which was unprecedented. And uh, that, a lot of that also had to do with the reporting of e-commerce sales, which hadn't been reported in the past. Um, the Wayfair versus South Dakota decision um, allowed the state of Illinois to collect more of those sales taxes. So that was another reason why they went up so significantly, even with COVID. So then the other thing we like looking at is, you know, what, what are the individual retail categories doing? And these numbers are for the Chicago metropolitan area. So, you know, we've seen some decline in the general merchandise, like all the department stores that closed over the years um, with Carson's and um, Sears, thank you. <laughs> some of the JC Penney's, uh, and there's really been a lot of consolidation in uh, the Lord Taylor's that closed, the Macy's that closed, the Bloomingdale's that closed. So that's been a, a, a category that everyone's kind of been watching. And then food sales went crazy during COVID because everyone had to buy their groceries in a store and couldn't go out to eat. And so they were really significant. Now they're coming back down. And, and one of the other factors is inflation and how inflation has impacted some of these sales. But the, um, if you look at, you know, the drinking and eating places after, before and after COVID and how those have changed. So one of the other things is like what's happening with retail vacancy. And so we've seen, you know, a lot of vacancy. Um, I've got some numbers on the, the recent vacancies, but you look at like the Toys R Us closing, Carson Sears, Sports Authority, Sam's Club, Art Van Furniture, Bed Bath & Beyond. You know, those are some pretty significant vacant stores that all of a sudden you've got a glut of new space. So um, there is about 13 million square feet of vacant anchor stores at the end of 2022. And um, there were, in 2020, there were 275 vacant anchors or 16 million square feet. So when we're trying to attract retailers to Niles, um, these factors are things that we have to consider and what types of retailers should we be targeting for um, our, our vacant spaces in Niles? So I also track all the expanding retailers. Um, you know, I noticed uh, like over on 2 Avenue, Advanced Auto Parts is going into the old Pet Boys. So, you you know, you look at, at these things. Um, uh, I just saw Steinhoffels. I mean, they opened a store by um, Harlem and uh, Foster and you know, so we kind of look and see who's active in the market. Um, Yardbird was kind of a cool store that they opened up in Highland Park and in Oak Brook. Um, but a lot of the grocers were very active. And so one of the ones on the list here is Amazon Fresh Gro Grocery. And those haven't really done well. If you look at the, uh, the one of the last ones to open was over in Morton Grove. And they're just not generating the sales productivity that they should be. And so Amazon put them on hold and they're calling them zombie stores. So there's several that are were planned to open and are built and are just not opening. Uh, Buffalo Grove and Arlington Heights and several others. So the, um, you know, I'd love to get a Nordstrom rack. Um, I think that's a store and I've talked to them and they're real estate people. Um, that would be a, a great addition in Niles to, to this one that, and then uh, we were dealing with Park to Shop, and they actually took over the SC Grocery. So it's, uh, and this list is not all inclusive. It's just these were some of the ones that I've seen that have been active. The, the John Blue Market, so some of the ethnic grocers have been very active. And then obviously looking at uh, restaurants. So if we, you know, could get um, some of these new restaurants that are out there um, that are active and you know, at least with Golf Mill, I'd like to see more unique restaurants rather than chains. And I think a lot of our, our village board leadership would like to see that as well. But these are some of the, you know, 
I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a beef shack and then, you know, a, a Starbucks with the drive through and some of these things locating around golf mill as golf mill gets redeveloped because it's kind of been overlooked because it wasn't as strong of a mall as it could be. Um, and you look at some of the, the, the more class A malls and things around Old Orchard and so forth that we could possibly add. I'd love to get another Portillo's. We have uh, two Chick-fil-A's. Um, John Morris is here from Chick-fil-A. So, you know, if we could have two Portillo's, um, their sales productivity is off the charts. Um, and so that would significantly enhance our sales tax revenue stream. Some of uh, the strategic goals for 2024 for uh, the village and economic development is enhance our business attraction, our business retention, marketing, grant administration, and uh, TIF district redevelopment. We uh, should have our redevelopment agreement completed with Sterling and create a master plan mixed use development. I'm also working on the YMCA site, which is uh, for sale. There was a contract purchaser that did not move forward, but um, that whole Tui triangle, you may have noticed um, the village owned the Granger property. We entered into a contract with Costco and they purchased three acres of that property from the village and they tore down the Granger site quickly. It was great. And uh, so, and then we reimbursed them with TIF dollars to pay for that. And then they bought the property from us. So it's, um, they're a lot of um, able to add employee parking to one of their most profitable stores. But this was one of the, one of the most under parked properties in their portfolio. And so by having additional parking, for their employees and customers, it's going to drive sales. And they are like having a small mall. When you look at it, it's confidential, but what their sales um, productivity is at that store, um, that was someone that we wanted to retain in Niles for many years to come. So that's why we sacrificed some people's opinion at three acres to keep Costco. Lincolnwood and Morton Grove and some of the surrounding communities were saying, come on over to you know our community. And that was not a Costco store, that was a builder square. So it wasn't their prototype store. So I think that it was um, absolutely the right thing to do. And we hope that that will help generate additional traffic to that location and that we can do some interesting things with the YMCA site and the, and the balance of the Granger site, which is about another five acres. So we're uh, finalizing the 24, excuse me, 2040 comprehensive plan. And, and that is a really um, large undertaking. I mean, this looks at comprehensively the village and what we want to do in the future and what, what sites and what is Milwaukee mm -hmm. Avenue going to look like in our other commercial corridors. So some of the plan development I went through a little bit, but the, the golf mill redevelopment and the YMCA, I, I didn't mention the car wash, but uh, they're going to add a car wash. And they're also adding more fuel pumps on the existing fuel center site. So they're going to enhance the efficiency and sales productivity of that location because people were in line already. And now you just have more pumps <laughs> to, to, to fuel their cars. We, uh, we approved a development by T2 Investments um, on South Milwaukee Avenue at about 63, um, 6633 North Milwaukee, which is a 100, uh, it's a 180 unit luxury apartment development. It's about a $70 million project. And so they tore down the former HESCO building, a janitorial supply industrial building. It was about 70,000 square feet. And I think that's going to be a really great project. Um, they've had some hiccups with the uh, with financing and so forth. With we went from about five percent interest rates with eleven eleven interest rate hikes, and now it's like ten percent. So I'm I'm confident that that's going to move forward, and that will create um, additional residential opportunities, and hopefully um, enhance our socioeconomic characteristics and bring in like a higher income resident that can afford. $3,000 a month or $2,000 a month for an apartment. We uh, recently um, 
approved a term sheet with Nehemiah Development to uh, develop um, a $20 million, 48 unit mixed use development up near Golf Mill. It's right near Norbert Pools. Um, that's kind of a blighted area right there. And so this is one of the first steps in addressing that commercial blight and adding new residential and retail facility um, on that site. And uh, Star Nissan and uh, Infinity, they're gonna undertake a $6 million renovation and create separate entrances for each dealership. They feel that that will um, enhance the customer experience because the customer profile of the uh, Nissan customer is different from the customer profile for the Infinity customer. And so um, we felt that that was a um, significant investment. And so we prepared a sales tax incentive agreement. So if they generate sales above a certain benchmark, they get to re 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 rebate some of those sales to them. And then they stay in Niles. They had been courted by other communities to move the dealerships off of Tui Avenue. Um, and you may have seen, uh, and maybe not read about it yet, but Village Crossings, we worked with the developer of Village Crossings. They're going to tear down that parking deck, which is kind of falling down. It was originally developed there um, um, by Cy Taxman and the Taxman Corporation. And so uh, that will create additional parking and uh, kind of get rid of uh, uh, a liability, <laughs> if you will. Um, they really was. They had already like closed the second level. They weren't using it, and it's kind of uh, detracts from the aesthetics of the, the property. So that's going to get torn down. And then you may have noticed Starbucks opened last week at Oakton in Milwaukee, and uh, Buffalo Wild Wings um, should be not too far behind. That's about a five thousand square foot multi tenant building um, out in front of Jewel. And we're also working on the Niles Teen Center which is located at Milwaukee Avenue and Dempster, just north of Dempster on the west side of the roadway there, about 8820 North Milwaukee. And so uh, the teen center is currently housed in Golf Mill Mall, and that is going, we're gonna lose that location eventually. So we're working with the developer to redevelop that building. I think it's, uh, our objectives are twofold. It'll eliminate a blighted property that looks terrible. And we get uh, them to redevelop that property and put in the teen center and other tenants. Um, but again, the financing environment's been challenging for developers, so it's it's slowed that one down a little bit. I think um, you know our village board it really takes vision to look at all these different sites and what is the appropriate development plan for these sites. So the Golf Mill Mall Shopping Center, if we didn't have a village board that wanted to really take an active role in this, it might never get redeveloped. I mean, it could be like Ford City Mall, or if you've been out to West Dundee to Spring Hill Mall, where there aren't any tenants left, the parking lots are vacant and it's very sad. So we have a village board that wants to move forward and provide an incentive, a reasonable incentive to the developer with performance benchmarks that they have to actually build all these new things and then they benefit from the TIP district. And so I think, uh, you know, that redevelopment will also, as I mentioned, enhance our commercial corridors and grow the business climate. You know, right, everyone wants to know what's happening with Golf Mill when we actually have Golf Mill under redevelopment and there's some exciting things happening that's gonna help the business climate in Niles and our going to help my business attraction efforts and make it a lot easier because the retail market in particular, it's like the herd mentality. Once you get, like if we got Nordstrom Rack or we get certain retailers, then all the other retailers want to be nearby them. So um, we've got to get the train rolling and uh, bring in some of these other retailers. I think the village, uh, because all those sales tax revenues is uh, able to deliver outstanding village services. And when you have $1.8 billion in retail sales, we're top in the top 10 in retail sales in the entire metropolitan area. And that compares to Naperville and Schaumburg and Joliet um, and others. And we're in the top 10. And we can be even higher with the golf mill that's redeveloped. I think, uh, you know, if we, but while we're in the midst of all this growth, we still have to remember to provide the quality of life. So 
we can't have gridlock on Tui Avenue and some of our other roadways. I mean, we have to be cognizant of how these developments impact the residents. And I really want to um, work on some of these residential projects because I think, like when I was in Wheeling, we developed 941 apartment units, really nice apartment units that attracted a new resident. And these actually will bring people here to the community and then they get to know it and then they buy a home and then they have families. Um, we were really not trying to attract students to these new residential projects. The rent is too high. I mean, you might as well go buy a house. So um, these are more for um, empty nesters, divorcees, professionals that don't have children yet, but want to have resort luxury living and have the swimming pool and all the amenities. So I think at Golf Mill, we'll be able to create a, a downtown type environment. And so um, I've got a couple of photos here I just wanted to share with you. So this is that T2 Investments building, a rendering of that on South Milwaukee Avenue. So that's 180 units backing up to the forest preserves and the north branch of the Chicago River. And it's going to have rooftop amenities and swimming pool and so forth. And then the second one to the right is the Nehemiah development. It's a $20 million development just north of Norbert Pools. And uh, so that will really change the aesthetic of that area. And that developer would like to move right down the street and continue to develop additional buildings similar to that. Uh, this is the Golf Mill Chevrolet. That was a former Best Buy. I'm pretty proud of this, that we actually took a Best Buy that had been vacant for more than six years. And I worked with um, Golf Mill Chevrolet to come up with an economic incentive agreement. And they invested about $10 million in buying this property and then redeveloping with a full service facility. And, and that is going to generate pretty significant sales tax revenues to the village. This is another one I kind of like. It was a little bit innovative. Um, this was Skokie Automotive at Waukegan in Milwaukee. It had been vacant for years and it, it was an eyesore. And so this is called the doghouse and they are printing money over there. I mean, they, they, they uh, take care of dogs and shampoo dogs and they do a great job. I'm a customer, I pay full price. I was going to them when they were in Chicago um, but that I thought was a really nice adaptive reuse of that property. And they got plenty of parking and they could accommodate a lot of dogs. So this was the former Starbucks at Point Plaza. And we brought in Pokey Brothers. And then next to them was a Melt and Dip. And then cr everyone likes crumbled cookies. We got them in there and uh, they're opening a second location up by um, Patel Brothers up at Golf in Milwaukee. So um really nice um, reuse of some of those properties. And obviously Chick-fil-A, we got our second Chick-fil-A unit. Um, and John Morris is here from, from that uh, franchise. And, you know, we're fortunate to have two, two of those locations in our community. They are, you know, the top fast food operation in the country. Maybe I shouldn't say fast food, but they're uh, one of the high volume restaurants in that category. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Park to Shop, we had been talking to them about uh, the old, old Meyer space up in um, uh, where in the Meyer space on Golf Road. And uh, so they ended up, they wanted to be in Niles very badly. And so we worked with them and they, they went into IC Plaza and took over the IC um, space. And then uh, we had another Dunkin' Donuts open. Uh, and then the chamber event, uh, ribbon cutting and so forth. And we have a uh, bear paddle sw swim school opening at uh, Village Crossing. So that is going to be, a, you know, taking the former Pier 1 space that was vacant. So we're recycling some of these vacant spaces. I mentioned the Buffalo Wild Wings and Starbucks. So Starbucks opened last week and hopefully Buffalo Wild Wings will open soon. We're working on this middle space. Uh, this is an aerial of the Granger redevelopment. So they tore down the Granger building. And uh, now Costco has their parking lot in and it really came out nice. And then uh, there's a new bubble tea in uh, the, the uh, Civic Center Plaza that just opened last week, I believe. 
And then the middle rendering is of Star Nissan and Infinity. So this is really going to look nice. And they're going to generate a lot of sales tax revenue. And we're going to have to rebate a little bit of it. But we, if they would have left, we would have got zero. So I think uh, that was really a, a, a wise decision by the village board to support that. And then, um, you know, these this was where Pity Kingdom and... Uh, Izzy's and the end salon was and they were all vacant when I first got here and so I think this was a nice adaptive reuse with these eye care centers um you know really really nice um um in that particular instance we didn't have to provide any incentives other than we allowed some parking variations and then um this last one on the right is Sablana events this was the original uh not original this was one of apt electronics locations they had one in Chicago, but then there was one here on Dempster. Mm -hmm. And so Sablana Events is going to sell flowers and events um, and like cater to that when you have a wedding and you want like centerpieces and flowers and everything. And they came from the Splains and we provided a Cook County uh, Class 7 incentive for them to make this economic for them. Um, and they, they put in several hundred thousand dollars into renovating this building. So, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of things that I'm not gonna be able to talk about yet because they're they're not public, but these are some of the, the developments that I've been spending a lot of time on. And I'd like to actually get a couple more car dealerships um, because they generate a lot of revenue and getting Golf Mill going is gonna help me do that. And we've got a great team. Um, my IT director is here today and our assistant village manager um, and um, Rusty Jacket is here. I mean, we got a great team and we are going places. We are, you know, we, we really, we have a mayor who wants to get things done. And I think that we have like our IT infrastructure is working great and uh, that really helps us be more efficient. And so I'm really looking forward to getting this redevelopment agreement um, finalized and approved by the village board and moving forward. I would be, um, I, I have a list of some of the businesses if I, I think I mentioned almost all of them, but uh, the chamber has the presentation if anybody wants it, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any at this juncture. Yes, please. I'm good, thank you. Questions which I also post to, uh, um, Lincoln with Mayor Lincoln with them because they're redeveloping um, they're the town center. Well, and then they just talked their development just did District 1860. I actually did the market feasibility study on that for Neil Stein, who was the owner previous to Tucker. Got it. So, the one thing I asked, um, and I did see in their consideration of what the businesses that they want to attract for. Um, and I didn't see in your presentation, but you may be thinking about it, was some um, indoor sports facilities. Um, the number of, you know, in, interesting, there's a lot of like travel clubs and leagues in, in the community, and they're always, they're like vying for indoor spaces. Um, I know that there's a, 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 a indoor sports facility out in Schaumburg next to the airport. Um, and it's like a multi-use indoor sports facility because our weather is always cold. And, you know, for for teams to be able to have like competitive foot in an indoor area on off season or, you know, when, when the climate is not so good. Um, I don't know if that's something that we definitely need. Those kind of facilities need large spaces. And I don't know if that's something, we don't really have one in this whole area. Like if you look at Lincolnwood Niles, but we, um, what we wrote. There's nothing like that in our area, and I know like all these teams are, you know, fighting for that indoor space. And I don't know. So we have energy on Howard Street, and so that's one. And and in the past, those types of uses um have gravitated to industrial locations because of the rent that they can pay, and a lot of their activities are on the weekends, but it's grown exponentially because there just isn't enough time to accommodate everybody. And so a lot of the mall owners have looked at those types of uses for vacant department stores, and it's more on an interim basis. 
you look at um, like pickleball is going crazy right now. So the problem is, um, if you look at the site plan for the mall, some of the big anchor spaces are already spoken for. And to build a new facility and, a, and their ability to pay the rent and pay $30 a square foot. So that's why they've gravitated to some of these industrial locations. But now the industrial market is so robust with Amazon and all the distribution and logistics that they're having difficulty finding spaces. So we certainly, as I mentioned, want to look at experiential retail and more entertainment. Um, and so that is something we're looking at, but it might go to a second generation building where the rent is going to be more affordable for that type of use. And Lincolnwood Town Center could certainly accommodate that with some of their space that's vacant. Sterling, uh, the Sterling organization that owns the mall is thinking about all those things, but they also think about rent. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, my pleasure. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, so um, again, if you would like the slides, just let myself or Aaron know and we'll forward those to you. And there's also a recording of today's event. So I think we're just going to um, next ask uh, Senator Laura Murphy uh, to say a few words, as casual or as formal as you'd like, whatever you would like. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me or do you want me to go to the microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I usually don't have a problem presenting. <laughs> um, so my, I'm Laura Murphy, State Senator in the 28th District. And the 28th District now includes a part of Niles. Every time the census is done, we redistrict legislative districts and um, both Senate and House and Judicial. So that's why it's the first you're seeing me. I've been in the General Assembly for seven years now, but I never had any of Niles. My district used to stop really around um, Minor and Northwest Highway, Northwest Highway and Park Ridge there. So, um, however, I have been in the area for probably most of my life. Um, my first concert, this will date myself, but my first concert was the Jackson Five at the theater in the round at um, the Golf Mill Theater, if you, um, any of you remember the opportunity of going there. So I, I, my family grew up in the area, I've been in the area, uh, and I served as a alderman in the city of Des Plaines for eight years. Des Plaines, now as Niles does, is one of the few communities that has term limits. So we did our eight and um, they, we were done. And then the opportunity presented in 2015 that the prior Senator was stepping down and they asked if I would consider doing that. So I have enjoyed every minute that I have been in the GA. I serve now as the assistant majority leader. I also serve on executive appointments. I chair the executive appointments. So any appointment that goes, uh, that uh, requires Senate confirmation, goes through my committee. Um, and then I serve on you know, a host of other, but I, I particularly like the appropriations because we, in budget decisions, where all the money lands is where most of the decisions get made. And then um, I'm particularly fond of higher education. I've always maintained the idea that um, I came in during the Rauner administration when we had no budget. And we knew the path to recovery for Illinois was to ensure that we were educating our kids, that employers wanted an educated workforce, that if we could educate kids, keep them in Illinois, we would be able to make that investment in K through 12, which we do really well because Illinois ranks number seven in the state, in the country of our ACT scores, seven in the country. Um, so we're doing something right in our education. And as we um, educate a kid, then we try and keep them in our higher education program, which we have U of I ranking ninth in the nation 
Um, Forbes just came out with that ninth in the nation of some of the of the best public institution of higher ed. So if we could keep all those kids, we know we would turn our state around. And we have done that. Illinois now, I'm really happy to say, has seen seven credit upgrades in the last 40 years, even during a pandemic. So depending upon who you follow, Fitch has us rated a little lower, but Moody's and s and all have us at A, A minus status. So things are turning around there. We also are paying our bills. Um, believe it or not, that was an anomaly in the state. Um, we went, because we didn't have a budget for 763 days, there was no money to pay any vendors, pay universities, pay our rent, pay any bills for the state. We now are paying our bills on time. And not only are we paying them on time, we have created a rainy day fund that has $2 billion in it right now. So we have fiscal solvency within the state. We have $2 billion in that rainy day fund. We are, um, bills are paid within you know, less than, um, usually a 13 day cycle is how long it's taking to pay bills now. We've pay, um, paid off all our back debt. And in the past administration, that was at $9 billion. Um, that was immediate debt that we had to pay off. So things are really turning around and looking up. We um, have a budget that is balanced. We don't spend more than what we take in. Uh, the state of Illinois, majority of our tax revenue comes from individual taxes. Um, almost 50%, over 50% of all the revenue that the state generates comes out of um, personal income tax. Businesses pay approximately um, 18% into that fund as well, and then other sources make up the rest of our budget cycle. But those are the things that um, have really turned around in the state. Um, so it's really, I think it's really exciting. And things can turn around based upon leadership and what it's really exciting to see. Um, I've always been an optimist about the state of Illinois, and I'm really thrilled now that the data supports that in everything that we say can be verified and is actually happening. And um, we, our last budget really was reflective of the values that the state wants to invest in. Early childhood received a significant amount of money in that budget because you know that's, that's the future. We have to educate kids. We have to ensure that that education um, meets employers' demands and it starts in early education. And any of you that are in that sphere and in schools know that kids are such sponges when they're um, in those early years. And let's capture that. Let's make sure that we're able to capitalize on that and to go forward with that. But I probably, more, most of you are more concerned with the dollars and cents in the business environment. So we did appropriate an additional $400 million for businesses. We've created programs that allow businesses to apply for grants for funding. Um, and, and there is money available for that. We're working at the rest of the um, federal dollars that we received from COVID. Uh, we have still another year probably to get that all out the door. And then um, with our responsible budgeting, though, we're setting a path where we can continue to fund the programs that are important to us in the state. So we're working on that. Um, we've distributed tons of PPP money throughout the Northwest suburbs, businesses, and I should say the 28th district that it started with this. It covered um, a little part of Niles, um, most of Park Ridge, most of the Plains, some of Elk Grove, most of Schaumburg, um, some of Roselle and Hanover. So that gives you an idea of where my district goes um, all the way west. Uh, so those are the things that I think are really exciting that are happening within the state. And maybe I don't want to say everything so that my colleagues have an opportunity to also, and then we can maybe have some interaction questions. If there's any questions that you want to ask, you can ask us anything. That's how, how much they weigh. Um, and that, uh, but happy to um, entertain any questions you might have. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you.
Senator Murphy, appreciate that. I think up next, if you're ready, are you, oh, are you up next. Get the arm wrestle for it. Stay right, Mike Kelly, why don't you climb up and stay up Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm the state representative for the 15th district. Uh, the 15th district represents about 70% of Niles, about 50% of Morton Grove, and then I have about 95% of the 39th ward on the northwest side of the city, and I have a little bit of the 45th ward, and I also come down into uh, a couple of precincts in Park Ridge. Um, I've been in the assembly since uh, November of 21, where I replaced longtime uh, incumbent John D'Amico, and uh, was honored to get that appointment and honored to be in, fifth, in the 15th district representing the uh, village of Niles. Um, as Senator Murphy said, uh, downstate, we've done what we all think is a pretty fantastic job of turning things around and getting our uh, state back, back at, in fiscal responsibility and improving our credit upgrades. Um, as far as the education uh, investments, we've made an additional 350 million in education investments uh, for early uh, childhood. Uh, education. So very important to get, as she said, to get the kids um, learning at the early age and getting kindergarten for everybody and making sure the kids get on the right track at that young age. Um, as far as uh, the villages and the cities are concerned, we increased the LDGF, um, which gives more, more money back from sales tax and those types of taxes back to each of the individual villages and uh, municipalities. Um, it's about $100 million this year. Historically, it was supposed to be at 10%. I think we've got it up to 6.74. Is it 7.4 now? 6.74, okay. um, which was 0.47% this year. Um, the state fights us every year for it. The mayors come down every year, three, 400 of them for one, for one lobby week, and they really push for this. So I know myself, I'm, I'm pushing for it every year to get it back to, um, I think the goal is 8%. Hopefully, eventually, the 10%, but that's a big push from the mayors, because then the mayors can distribute it to local uh, businesses and get uh, better funds available for local businesses. Um, this year in the General Assembly, um, one of the major bills that I passed was a, you would think it's a common sense bill, but it wasn't on the book. So um, you can't Zoom and drive. You can be on your phone hands-free, but until this year, and the governor just signed it this summer, you could still be on Zoom on the screen. And um, so I was happy to get that passed. Uh, it went through the Senate and the House uh, unanimously. But like those are the kind of things, the little loopholes that we don't see that just help uh, further safety of everybody in Illinois. Um, the Senator, Senator Bill Lam and I uh, sponsored a uh, economic or uh, environmental bill. Uh, on soil. Um, that was a, a collaborative bill that the senator brought over to the House. I brought it to the House floor, uh, it or to the committee, it passed, but with the contingency to come back, we had to work with the Environmental Council, a couple other groups to get that done to help preserve the soils for the farmers in the state of Illinois. So um, that was another one of the bills that um, I was happy to present. Um, and then a couple other things that I was able to do with uh, some funds from the state of Illinois. Um, in talking to George and the chief of police and a couple of the other, the Morton Grove chiefs of police, a couple of my commanders in the 17th district, um, that list license plate readers throughout the 15th district. Um, I believe I'm going to get, I think a total of nine in the 15th district, three in the 16th district of the city, three up in Niles, three in Morton Grove. And what these do is it allows the police to read license plates as for vehicles that have committed a crime and they can follow them. And then they can, everybody can be in um, contact with other municipality polices, police departments, and we can follow that car wherever it goes and we can make arrests. If it happens in Niles, we can get them in Chicago. Now we're not preventing that, that crime, but we are preventing that, that car and the people that were in it from doing the next crime, hopefully. So those are some of the things that I did this year and uh, with the help of the Senator here and the House and the, and the Senate and um, continue to do good work for the state and thank you for letting me talk today. Thanks. Thank you.
Bill Vader gets the mic. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, we're just, the audio is just a little bit better. Hello? <laughs> there you go. They want to record me. Uh, no, good morning. Uh, thank you so much. I don't want to be towering over you like that. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for putting this on. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Ron Gleeval. I'm the state senator for the 8th district, um, which encompasses about a half city, half suburbs. I go down from uh, from Montrose Avenue all the way up to Morton Grove. Um, I have uh, all of Lincoln Wood, parts of Skokie, Niles, and Morton Grove. Um, but the neighborhoods in the city of about more than 20 neighborhoods. Um, from Albany Park to West Ridge. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, this is a part of the job that I enjoy and uh, we need uh, because this is how um, we translate, you know, what we are hearing from constituents uh, to the work we do in Springfield. Um, you know, Leader Murphy touched on uh, the budget. Uh, Representative Kelly touched on um, some of the other investments and in, in legislation. Uh, that we, we uh, were able to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few topics that I think um, indirectly affect people here and, and all of us across the state. Um, I'll start by saying, though, that we have uh, handouts at the table um, that have um, the legislation that I worked on in the past, and also, I think, booklets from DCEO, um, or the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, that kind of list out the grants and, and loan opportunities as well um, for small businesses. Um, so in the Illinois Senate, I'm chair of transportation. And uh, I, uh, um, along with my colleagues, oversee um, you know, all of the transportation infrastructure uh, needs and, and questions and, and funding across the state. Uh, so just a quick uh, couple of points on that. One, um, in 2019, we passed what's called the Rebuild Illinois Plan, $45 million over six years uh, for strategic investments in our horizontal and vertical infrastructure. Uh, at, at that point in 2019, we had a D minus in uh, by the American Society of Civil Engineers in our roads, bridges, and mass transit. I think I, I remember I was my first year, my first year. Um, I'm so just for context, I'm in my second term. Uh, uh, and so I learned a lot, but my first year, my jaw dropped because um, we had, a, we had a, a committee hearing and we were told we had over 2,000 deficient bridges uh, in, in the state. And uh, I, I asked them, you know, would you want to drive over a deficient bridge? And obviously the answer was no. Uh, and so we took, took it upon us um, to, to kind of analyze and do, do the work. We passed the capital bill that would start to address these uh, concerns. Uh, we also made a lot of, in that same capital bill, investments in vertical infrastructure. Um, and so, um, Representative Kelly might have touched on it a little bit, but you might hear of funding that we got for the Village of Niles that includes um, two million for the salt dome and stormwater management and other, other items like that. That's considered part of that infrastructure, part of that 45 billion. And transportation is one of those issues where, and I would feel the of it, um, you know, people don't think about it until it's a problem, right? Uh, and I, you know, I don't think about a pothole until my tire goes over it and I'm sitting there for an hour uh, in the rain. Uh, and so um, we made that investment. We're in the midst of that six year plan. We have to ensure that it's completed and um, done in a way where uh, we are um, so improving our roads, bridges, and mass transit. Speaking of mass transit, um, the pandemic uh, expedited. Uh, a funding crisis with our uh, transit system. Uh, every major public uh, transit agency in the United States of America is facing a severe uh, uh, funding crisis. Um, we are down 50% ridership. So uh, when we talk about mass transit, what are we talking about? We're talking about CTA, Metro, Pace, across the RTA region. And so that's, that's what we're facing in the state of Illinois. Um, we uh, and for, for, fortunately, in some ways, the rest of the state outside the RTA region is not facing the same fiscal cliff, um, mostly because uh, people in those areas um, are very reliant on whatever transit they're using, right? They don't have the same uh, level of options that we do. That being said here, uh, with the combination, mostly because of remote work, but also you think about all the different modes of transportation that are, that are popping up between Uber, Lyft, Divi's, scooters, 
We all see them, you know, here and there. Um, it's a challenge. So we're in the process of uh, figuring out how to respond to that challenge. We know that a lot of our workers across the region rely on public transit to get to their job. Um, and so, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we're moving forward. That being said, we can't, we will not write a blank check to RTA, Metro, CTA, or PACE without seeing some reforms and seeing uh, some innovation as to how we're going to meet people where they need to uh, be met and also where they need to go. Um, it is absolutely an issue that some of us might not take public transportation, but the way I describe it sometimes is um, if we don't have people going downtown, um, that means that those restaurants and that industry downtown will um, not survive and that will have a major impact for everybody. Um, and so that's, you know, part of that, but also even here, right? We, we just literally had a conversation with uh, Melinda um, at Pace about the Pulse station um, that is uh, the Pulse uh, route, I should say, that's going from all here to Evanston and going through Niles. Uh, and so there's ways that we can um, have public transit um, that um, will allow folks, our employees, our workers to get from point A to point B in a safe, accessible way. So absolutely um, open to feedback on that. The other issue I want to talk about that's indirect, um, but I think uh, is important is um, the, the, the folk, and, and you, heard, you heard about a lot of the issues that impact you all directly. I want to touch on one that we're hearing about in the news, which is um, the asylum seekers that are coming to our state. We have more than 13,000 since last September that are, have been dropped off um, at uh, Union Station or O'Hare Airport. Uh, there's over 2,000 at the Chicago Police Station at O'Hare Airport. Um, this is nothing short of a humanitarian crisis. Um, we are being, you know, uh, the city of Chicago is, is being responsive. It is incredibly hard. Uh, we're not given much, uh, City of Chicago is not given much of any information when they're dropped uh, at Union Station or here at airport. Um, it, is a, it is a humanitarian crisis that is going to be become uh, our, large, our largest challenge, most likely, uh, because of the complexity of it. Um, in order for uh, them to uh, provide a living for themselves, they need work authorization from the federal level. This is something that Quite frankly, business leaders locally and um, uh, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, Illinois Restaurant Association, everybody wants because they want workers. Um, however, that has to come from the federal level, and that's a challenge. Um, and so, I know that that hasn't it hasn't hit Build the Village and Isles specifically, but um, it is an issue that uh, is um, uh, at the forefront because of the influx, because of uh, the type of complexities that exist with those folks coming in, not knowing their health conditions, not having a place for them, them not being able to work, and so much more. Um, and so um, happy to answer questions on that as well, but I did want to touch on that because we are seeing it in the news. Um, I'm going to stop there because um, I would like, to, I'm happy to answer any questions. I think other issues have been um, uh, discussed. I'll just say that our offices are here to help you. And um, there are, times where the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity and other departments have grant opportunities. That's where we, you know, we have specifically voted to appropriate those funds for those grant opportunities. And we want to be a resource and a supporter when you all apply for those. Um, and so when you all submit an application, there are times where we can uh, write a letter of support. Um, there are times where uh, we can bring out the department to do a workshop. Those are things that we can absolutely do. Um, so with that, I'll stop and uh, happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for Senator Pilgrim? Yes, I don't have a question. I'd like to say anything. It's okay. Oh, so I okay, have my back to anyone either. But um, so my name is Becky Keene. I'm the president of the library board here. And I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm very proud to be able to be here, represent the library um, and tell you all that we appreciate having you here every month. We appreciate the partnership. Um, and while our legislators are here talking about all kinds of economic things that are extremely important, I want to also put a little attention on the help that they've been giving the library. You know, there's a lot of things, libraries are coming under attack for so many things right now. 
just uh, received a slew of black threads, which is very scary. I'm also a librarian professionally, so this is really a big deal for me on all levels. But um, I just want you all to know that we are here for you. We love working with you guys, but also to let you know that these legislators have been backing our library um, and all the other libraries in our state as well. They have championed legislation for libraries, and so we are very grateful to have them here right now and always. So thank you very much for that, and welcome, and please come back and use the library. Thank you. Um, I'm a small business owner here in the village and I, you guys are great. Everything you're doing is wonderful. You've helped me in the past get grants, your, your office, you've been, you've been great. And I want to bring up something. I don't know if you didn't have anything to do with this, but you know how like, in, you know, you're talking about people going downtown, uh, taking transportation, but a lot of it's fear, you know, and, and I think we, we have special laws to protect children from different things. Maybe you guys could look at some special laws to protect senior citizens also. You know, if there's a crime committed against a senior citizen, that should be treated differently, I feel. Did, I don't know if you saw the, the thing, that could, the former police chief riding his bike down the street, and the two kids get ran over for fun. And so let's, let's you know, I don't even want to say what they said, but they killed him. They ran him over. And when you see the old women getting their canes taken from them, beat with it. There should be some kind of special legislation, something. And I don't know if you guys deal with it because you're state, but something that would protect seniors. Also, there would be more of a bad crime if you if you attack us because we're prey. That's how you begin to feel when you get a certain age. You begin to feel like you're prey for them. I used to go downtown all the time. I don't park in the garage downtown. I refuse to. But I used to park under Millennium constantly and go walk around there and take my granddaughter. But it's there's a lot of fear, and that prevents people from going downtown. That prevents it. And we have the funds to spend. We're the people that travel. We're the people that, that have, you know, money that we can spend at these places, and we don't do it. So maybe it's something you could look at. I don't know how, but I would think that there should be something to protect If you're 80 years old and somebody can get right out of you, I'm sorry. They should go away. Because it's too easy, you know, and it's a, it'd be like hurting a child. But you know they have no recourse, so it, maybe it's something you can look at. I don't know how. I don't know. You, but all the all the other stuff, you guys, do great. I mean, you've done some wonderful things. But I think what it comes down to is law and order, also. So maybe you can look at that too. Thank you. I'll just say real quick on the transportation piece. Um, first, thank you for that feedback, and we we really appreciate it. Um, we passed legislation, uh, House Bill 1342, that um, would ensure across the state, if, if you are uh, a writer that um, commits uh, an, an aggravated assault um, or a public an act of public indecency, that the uh, public transit agency can suspend you from, from rider either. Um, so we have created that uh, scenario for public transit um, in an effort to your point um, to um, have a consequence. If, if you um, are on, and we've sort of heard the stories, right, from on the CTA, on the, on some on, you know, Metro, but uh, the reality is there needs to be a consequence, so we've done that. Um, and we, we, you know, I think uh, what I'll say to that too, though, is um, more ridership uh, equals safety too. Uh, if we can find a way to continue to innovate and continue to uh, motivate people to come, because if there's a like hundred people on a train versus two, um, you know, there's there's a different uh, level of safety, but your point is well taken, and I'm I'm sure to, to look it's into kind that. Of chicken and the egg. You yeah, have a lot right. more ridership. You have to feel safe. That's right. I have a Hispanic woman that works for me that's in her late 60s, and she would take the blue line. She would take the bus to see her brother in in Iowa, and she was on the blue line, and a man sat across from her and was just smiling, banging a bat. And not, she said, I'll never take public transportation again. Not even hurt her. But yeah. she didn't know she if he was going to whack her. Yeah. And, and nobody did. Everybody was like this because they were scared to death. I think until that's addressed, where people feel safe, you know, it's not just about arresting. I mean, if you got to get to the point where you get the crap kicked out of you for something to be done, that's not going to be done. No. You know, I just think uh, there has to be a little bit, it, it all plays, it all plays, you know. Everything kind of comes together. The hope is that with this new law, 
when people start to see that when incidents happen, that riders are suspended, that'll give them confidence to say, oh, there is a consequence. And then, you know, um, come and, back. And in addition to that, we're working at addressing some of those mental health issues that has put those people on public transportation and sometimes ride it all day long and create that fear. And, and rightfully so, because you never know what uh, might happen. So it, there's so many levels then that we have to reach out and work on those issues that has been exasperated after COVID. Um, and so we're trying to address those all. And then the last part, of course, has to be the perception. Because unless people feel safe, I think we can have all the statistics in the world that actually these crimes are down and these crimes, but if, if you're, if the perception exists there that you don't feel safe, we know we're not going to get people back into uh, the public transportation, back to enjoying restaurants and plays down in the city. And so it's a concerted effort that municipalities collectively with the General Assembly were working on. And we now have new provisions that uh, mitigating circumstances will determine whether or not someone will be able to be released. So. Uh, attacking a senior citizen would be something a judge would use as a mitigating circumstance to hold and detain people. Other questions? So, um, I mean, I think most of you were here for uh, John Melanthi speak from elsewhere in economic development, some of the things the village is doing to try to do that. Um, from a state level, I wonder what what part you all play in um, trying to attract businesses to Illinois and to Chicago from a from an employer standpoint. Like, how are we making it friendly for employers? Um, I think most of the legislation I see as a business owner is very employee centric, which is good. It's not a good part, but um, can be very punitive toward employers, uh, particularly for funding government programs. You know, kind of. It feeds itself, like non-compliance feeds fines, feeds, you know, this sort of thing. So what are you guys doing to try to make Illinois and Chicago and the areas more friendly from a regulatory standpoint to attract businesses here? So what we do is we have, we create a host of tax incentives that encourage businesses to come to Illinois. So for instance, we have a data center credit. And we have the second largest in the country data center in Outgrow, um, and only because there's not enough space. So we create a tax incentive, and we've recruited businesses from all over the world, frankly, Silicon Valley, other countries that are located now to Outgrow Village that are setting up data centers. We encourage communities to capitalize on those tax incentives. We do the same thing for film credits. We do the same thing for um, businesses, small businesses that have the ability to have tax incentives, whether it be on your property taxes, it comes from local municipalities, whether you can take that further to the state for some incentives. Um, and Illinois actually had more startups than any other state during COVID in 2021. So we have, uh, our program seem to be working and that's part of what's turned around the economy in Illinois as well, is that we have, we do protect workers, but we also provide an incentive. We create that balance with, this, with business um, so that both can thrive. Uh, the other thing that we did, um, I think it was my first year down there was, we voted to give the governor for over four hundred million dollars for tax incentives to get companies to come, and we just saw it. And then it was just in the last week with the uh, EV battery company re uh, locating in Illinois. So um, that was a big ask for us from the governor, and we were able to give it to him. So this is uh, part of what came out of that. So um, the governor's for this. The, the both both house and the center for incentivizing companies to come here. So that's that's a little bit of what we can do, and we saw it come to fruition uh, last week. I believe really was. Next question has to do with the cost of payer education. So, what are your? I'd like to hear what your thoughts are about you know funding early childhood. Right, I think we all recognize how important that is. But there are many kids out there, even with slight scholarships and everything else, that can't afford to go to college or university. So making them can't afford to go to 
um, junior college, right? Ah. Is that so are those topics that you're considering? I, I, I would say check the box we've done because there is no student in Illinois that cannot go to community college at no cost. The last set of legislation that we passed throughout the state, we increased MAC grants, we increased aid high, and we have given um, funding to our community colleges so that no student um, would be left behind. Any student in Illinois that wants to go to a junior college will do so in Illinois at no cost. Now, it, to carry over, then we made provisions so that the classes in your credit hours will transfer over um, to state universities after the community college. We're working on making that a seamless process as well. But there's no reason why anybody that wants to go to junior college and start as a junior college level in Illinois can can um, definitely can go. We also have in our four-year universities, we've created pathways. If you go into teaching, if you go into disabled service providers, if you go into social work, your tuition can be forgiven if you stay in that field. So we're creating those programs as well. I think we've created a wonderful path for students to go on to higher education, as well as incentives to participate in a trade program or an apprenticeship program. So we're covering both ends because not every student wants to go to college, but for those that want to go, they can start a junior college in Illinois. And I think the theme like we're hearing, right, is the whole ecosystem, right? And having, um, you know, the incentives, 400 million, we, we also passed 20 million for what's called the uh, downtown streets um, program for building Main Street. Um, 10 million for entrepreneurs to navigate um, and create a portal for them to be able to navigate, you know, grant opportunities and loans and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously, um, you heard about higher education, you heard about the transportation infrastructure. I've always said that uh, to bring people to the state of Illinois, I believe we need two things. Uh, the top two, I should say, is a strong higher education system that produces the best workforce, the most talented workforce. And two, a transportation infrastructure system that makes people want to move here because it's easy to get from point A to point B. And I think that we're in the midst of accomplishing the second. But the first, to Senator Murphy's point, we've made a lot of investments. Uh, but I also want to point out that it doesn't end just after higher ed. And it's not only for a private business, that the private sector, right, that we're having these challenges. The Illinois Department of Transportation has 200 engineering vacancies. And so when we talk about you know, moving these programs and getting these um, the money out and getting the projects done. Uh, we also need folks to work at the state, uh, and that is a challenge because um, you know I, I the engineering companies that that are out there offer twice the salary and um, oftentimes twice the benefits. So we have to get even more creative. And one of the things that we did was we created a, a pilot program for loan forgiveness. If you are an engineering graduate from a state university in Illinois and you go to work for IDOT for four years, you'll get four years of uh, loan forgiveness uh, or $15,000 a year for, for, for four years. It's a pilot program. We'll see. It's up to 50 people. We'll see how it works. Hopefully, it'll entice people that grab me. We graduate the best engineers in the, in the country, and oftentimes they're going to national companies instead of working at IDOT. So I always think about it this way, right? We're talking about that was seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of a budget line item, and we're talking about trying to get a forty-five billion dollar capital program out the door. So I don't. I think we need to make sure that we're not pennywise pound foolish when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to being innovative to get the best talent. So we're open more ideas on that front too. Um, going back to safety issues, I've been to a couple of different states this summer. And I've had people even call me and question me. They're seeing this garbage in the city with the seeing teens and how people are being attacked. How I think with a couple from Wisconsin had their car jumped on and broke the windows and stuff. And they're asking me, is it really safe in the city? Uh, I don't know. Is there anything that can be done about this kind of garbage? Because that's that's what they see on the news. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we said it before, right? First, first perception is is incredibly yeah. important. 
um, as is as is the way it happens to somebody, right? Um, look, I have a five year old, I have a two year old. I don't, I don't want them to be in an unsafe situation either. Um, I think what you're seeing is that we're trying to uh, first from to deal with the actual issue. We're trying to deal from it from with a holistic lens. We want to uh, address the root causes of the violence, um, understand what the issues are, mental health, um, and you know, lack of a job, and so much more. But also address the actual violence, right? And that requires um, us working with our local police departments, our police officers, police chiefs, uh, to ask what they need. So you heard one: we more license plate readers. Two: more funding, right? More funding always helps. Um, you know, we put in addition to our local police department funding, we put money in the budget to hire 200 more state troopers. Um, so these are all, I think, uh, I think it's about $1.1 billion of public safety uh, that we've allocated to address the different parts of uh, the spectrum in terms of the issues. Um, it's not easy. You know, it, it, when you look at the local news, sometimes it does get a little depressing. That being said, uh, we are trying to address it uh, with policy solutions, um, but it's going to take some time because every time an incident happens, it's like one step forward, two steps back. Um, but again, we're open to ideas and happy to. One of the things I know personally is from working at a high school, the level of respect is totally gone. And I think, I don't know how to, have, to push for people to respect each other, if it happened, it was a given in my generation. But they don't respect anything or anybody, let alone authority. So I don't know if you say, hey, this is a consequence. I had kids that were gang members who figured they weren't going to live long anyway because they were gang members. I personally knew kids who went across from Amy's years ago and beat a kid to death with lumber they found in somebody's yard. So, I don't know. If, if that, that's the route, if we can somehow get to that. I think we can hopefully make a difference. Well, just to quickly respond to that, um, obviously that starts in the home, but it also starts with what Senator Bill said, as far as mental health care, and expanding coverage on that, getting kids into that when we see it when they're five, six, and seven. So mm -hmm. it doesn't get pushed off and then they're 15 years old and we're trying to deal with it then. Um, we did invest money in that. Uh, I've got legislation coming up in 2024 that's hopefully going to address some of that. But with regards to what you said about downtown and that kind of stuff that goes on, um, those LPRs have been helpful in getting those cars that were part of blocking off streets. Those cars are pounded, they can't get them back. Um, the drones that are allowed to use be a lot uh, that are now allowed to be used in the state for especially for events. Um, those are going to help. But the other thing is, there was a incident probably a month and a half ago at Roosevelt Canal where there were hundreds of kids down, and I think they broke into a Seven Eleven. But you didn't hear that there was over fifty people arrested. And they all were detained, and they had to come, parents had to come and get them. That, that kind of thing, but that wasn't talked about. No, it's so. But there was, and so they they did start arresting some of these people, and the ages were from twenty eight down to twelve. So there was arrest made in that in these scenarios, and the police are able to do that. But you're not going to hear about it. But there are people being arrested for those uh, instances. So I just wanted to make sure that you didn't know about that. I appreciate. It. And I think that points out that the, cha the challenge with public safety is that public safety means something different to every community or every person, mm -hmm. right? So we've talked about going downtown. We haven't talked about cybersecurity. We haven't talked about, we've, we've funded $20 million for nonprofits that have faced threats from terrorism. Uh, if you remember in the last few years, um, the synagogue in Pittsburgh and uh, um, the mosque in New Zealand has brought up a lot of angst. There's been hate crime incidents. Right to the Jewish and Muslim community locally, um, so you know we're we're trying to like there's different facets of public safety across the spectrum, and um, you know some people some people that live in the city they live in pharmacy and food deserts and grocery store deserts right so they view that as a public safety issue for them 
right? How, you know, they have to go 10 miles to get, you know, their prescription or, you know, whatever the case may be. So it's a complicated issue. Trust me, we're, we're working on it. But as I keep saying, you know, we're open to feedback, we're open to suggestions. I think the senior, senior resident, you know, question mark is something, you know, we will definitely want to look into as well. I just want to add that tomorrow, um, the police department, along with the chamber, is running a program at the police department at 10 o'clock on uh, mental health and wellness in the workplace. Oh, good. So, Any other questions? I know we've run way over our time, but I'm so excited for that. I'm so excited to have you all here. Um, you know, let's let's bring all of those amenities to Niles so we don't have to go downtown ever again.